the spirit of Advent. And this is the first Sunday in Advent. And today we will look at the servants of God, the prophets, God's messengers sent to prepare the way. In our second Sunday in Advent, we talked about the hope and patience of Scripture and how these are particularly marked in the pattern chosen by God to confirm His Word to the world by means of prophecy. From the beginning, these prophecies provided the framework for life for or against God to all men. First, God declared His Word, as we saw from the beginning. And thereafter, each person has had to decide if they would keep or reject that word given. In the case of Adam and Eve and their faithful children, they received God's word and begat more children, as God had commanded, because they trust and received God's promise. They had the hope that from their seed, a son of the woman would come and defeat the serpent. And therefore, it was worth bringing children into this small world. But in the case of Cain and Cain's descendants, the opposite became the truth. Instead of living for God, obeying his word, and looking forward to the fulfillment of his promises, Cain, driven by jealousy, ignored God's warning concerning sin and killed his innocent brother Abel. And from then on, the children of Cain followed along the footsteps of their father. And thereby, the old world became filled with violence until God put an end to it with the judgment he announced on the flood. In the meanwhile, those who embraced the word of the promise learned to walk by faith remembering and waiting patiently for the fulfillment of God's promises, with a sure hope that regardless of how impossible such promises may have seemed for a long, long time, and regardless of how much the world would disregard God's word, eventually all would be fulfilled according to God's potential sovereign power and plan. Thereby, faith in the word of God provided both hope for the future as well as requiring patience, waiting for the completion of God's divine design, the details of which are hidden until they are finally fulfilled. Accordingly, the second Sunday in Advent stresses the importance of God's word for those seeking to justified by faith, and live upon this principle in this world. While the third Sunday in Advent turns our, which is today, turns our attention upon another key aspect of this divine design. The men chosen by God to be the ministers and stewards of his word and his mysteries, as we heard in our episode lesson. In other words, God's prophets. From the beginning, God chose a few among the many, only a select few, who would become his authorized instruments to convey his word to the whole world. Accordingly, the identity, character, and authenticity of this select and limited group have been always an essential aspect of God's revelation and redemptive plan. In other words, God did not send his word in an abstract way, 
did not send a pamphlet from heaven. Or in a discriminate manner, he did not give his word to everybody anywhere, just like that. Which would have opened gaps for uncertainty. And if uh, faced to valid doubts in regard of to who were those few people God had truly appointed as his witnesses. And what is the correct meaning of their teaching? On the other hand, God did the opposite. He appointed ministers that were clearly recognized as such by the divine appointment. One of the earliest examples of this unique prophetic role was Noah, who acted as a prophet to his generation. Peter refers to Noah as a preacher of righteousness. And Paul, in his letter to the Hebrews, explains how, this is a quote from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. <coughs> Here we find the pattern once more. God gives his word, and the faithful is commanded to prepare for the fulfillment. Of that word. So here we have all the essential elements of this pattern of revelation we have been talking about, which is characteristics of the divinely appointed prophetic ministry chosen by God to fulfill his purposes. First, God takes the initiative of, and calls a particular person he had chosen as his special messenger. And publicly acknowledged and confirmed as minister. In this case, it was Noah. When violence and evil prevailed upon the earth so that God, and this is a quote from Genesis 6, 5, saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually, God decided to destroy mankind from the face of the earth, unbelieving and sinful mankind, both man and beast and all birds. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So God revealed himself to Noah and communicated his word to him, telling him, the earth is filled with violence through men, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So God commanded Noah to build an ark in which his family and the animals will be saved to restart and repopulate the earth after the judgment of the flood. Noah heard God's word and believed it. He believed the word God told him and obediently built an ark following all the specifications God gave him. Now notice how this conduct reflected a great degree of faith. And Noah was justified by faith. It's the same, it's the same principle. Yes, God revealed his word directly to Noah. But the things God said from a human perspective and from an unbelieving perspective could appear very unlikely to happen. First, it seems that conditions upon the earth before the flood were different. And it is suggested that instead of rain, the earth was irrigated by water drops, not in rain, but in the form of a mist, as it is asserted in Genesis chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. six. So it is possible that no one had seen rain or experienced catastrophic conditions like hurricanes before God revealed this to Noah. So it is understandable that through all the years it took Noah to build this huge boat and collect all the necessary supplies, 
His contemporaries would have laughed at him to scorn, having lost any sense of respect towards God's revelation for his appointed messengers and the promise of salvation God had made to all who believe, they mocked God. And finally, we must consider that according to the Bible, in that age, before the flood, people used to live very long lives upon this world. So it was natural for them to assume the likelihood that they would continue living on as they had always lived. So they could reason, like, if God did not like what is going on in the world, he would have ended it long a time ago. And the fact that all things continue the same means that we can do whatever we please and that there will not be a day of reckoning, as Noah is warning us. Noah was therefore a preacher of righteousness, declaring to his generation God's moral judgment and their need to repent if they would escape God's judgment upon their generation. His warning and call to repentance were not based on human opinion or a forecast of trends. It was God's word that guided Noah to do what he did and to warn and call to repentance his generation to the last moment as Noah did. Regardless of the fact that most of their generation did not pay heed to his message. Also, humanly speaking, it would have been very difficult to gather and bring into the ark all the animals needed to preserve the life of the whole animal kingdom. <coughs> but it seems that the animals came to Noah in pairs and went into the ark willingly without Noah and his family having to go and hunt them down. And we can read this in Genesis chapter 7, verse 15. So again, we may imagine the skeptics in Noah's time objecting to the irrational expectation of Noah's conduct. First building a huge boat, and then expecting that that boat would be filled with animals. It would seem to them madness build such an ark and pretend to save animals, which he could not possibly gather or keep in such a condition by himself. So Noah's generation felt safe, felt safe in their skepticism. They disregarded God's warnings and God's word and God's call to repent. Yet in spite of all opposition, in spite of all unbelief, and in spite of the general disregard of his generation against the word of God, Noah received, kept, and prayed and preached God's word and acted accordingly. Noah obeyed and did everything the Lord told, told him, believing and trusting that God's word was true and that it was just a matter of time for God's judgment to be executed as he has said. Although no one knew the hour or the time when the door of the ark would be finally closed and judgment finally arrived. And notice this. Jesus used the days of Noah as a paradigm to compare this judgment with the judgment of the world which it will experience upon Christ's return. When Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 36, But of the day and hour knoweth no man, though not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. But it's in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, 
until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Like in the time of Noah, the whole world will be divided once more between believers and unbelievers, between those who trust God's word and prepare for it and those who disregard it. Noah was to his generation what the apostles and the prophets of the New Testament and the whole scripture is to us. Note first the uncertainty of the time of the final hour. Like the days of the Lord's return is uncertain to us, such it was also in the days of Noah. All those many years of patient construction and obedience were years lived walking by faith in spite of the general difference of the world. The world on its part continued as usual. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage, until the day that Noah entered in the ark. And so Jesus tells us, is the way it shall be in the days leading to his return. The unbelieving world will live in indifference, oblivious to God's word, just as in the days that were before the throne. They continue with their business, ignoring God's word, as if nothing would ever happen, as if God did not exist and had not spoken to Noah. But they were wrong. And Noah's word was vindicated when it was too late for them to repent. And so it will be. And this, the Lord said, is how it will be also in the days of his return. As we said, therefore, the apostles and the word of the gospel is to our generation, just as the word of Noah was to theirs. God's prophets are men who were chosen as eyewitnesses, who were commissioned by God to tell the world what God has determined to do and the way of salvation God has provided for us to be saved from the day of reckoning, which is coming, even though the final hour of the act of fulfillment remains unknown to us. We will know when, but we are sure the day will come. Like Noah, the apostles were commanded to build an ark, that is, the church of God, which is furnished with all things necessary for salvation, having only one door of entrance, the preaching of the gospel and baptism as the instrument by which we enter into the ark to enjoy all the benefits of Christ's sacrifice and are saved from the judgment to come of our believers. The only difference is that the apostolic family entering into the ark be saved from judgment the body of all believers who pay heed to God's appointed ministers was designed by God to become a multitude that no man can number, from every family and nation and language and tribe, as it is described in the book of Revelation. But the means of entering and what is at stake is essentially the same. <coughs> we enter by hearing the word of God with faith. Salvation through hearing God's word with faith. God has appointed his divinely ordained ministers, eyewitnesses of his revelation, and commissioned minister of his word to tell the world the truth about what's coming. In many ways, God has confirmed their unique identity, character, and message as his divinely appointed messengers of righteousness. First, they were chosen. Then they were trained and sent by Christ himself. 
being made eyewitnesses of his resurrection and ascension. And so the apostles went to preach the word to every nation. And so they have been received by all the faithful from the beginning to this very day. As it was foretold, the word of the gospel has filled the world in spite of the, again, of the unlikelihood that a humble group of Jewish disciples could ever do such a thing. So that generation after generation of believers up to this day has received the word of promise, entering willingly into the ark of Christ Church, while the unbelieving world accelerates their disregards of God's commandments, warning, and the offer of salvation. Now, consider the implications of this picture, and this analogy made by the Lord himself. If God has appointed his messengers, then hardly anything can be more important in this world than recognizing them as such and paying heed to their teachings and their warnings. May God grant us so to receive the testimony of God's chosen ministers that living in expectation of the Lord's return, we may be prepared for His coming. And also that having this hope, leading every decision of our lives, we may become effective witnesses to our generation, confirming and proclaiming the Word of God until the Lord's return. For the glory and honor of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who at thy first coming is sent thy messenger to prepare thy way before thee, grant that the ministers and stewards of thy mysteries may likewise so prepare and make ready thy way by turning the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, that at thy second coming to judge the world, we may be found an acceptable people in thy Son, who liveth and reigneth with the Father and the Holy Spirit ever, one God, world without end. Amen.